Welcome back to part two. So if you guys remember where we left off before we got so distracted with the whole Amazon New World thing, last week we are picking back up where we left off here with Skunk Works V4.69 Nice 420. So we got some things to do. This is the part where like, if you're not using all new parts, it's not glamorous. It's not super exciting. I've told you that some of these parts are reused. This 480 came out of Skunk Works. We showed you in part one. I took it out of the old Case Labs case. No, you guys can't buy that case. I've gotten, I don't know how many messages people going, could I buy that case from you? What's your price? No, you can't have it. It's mine. It's sentimental. It's staying with me. But we reused the pump and reservoir out of here. I want to change out this pump. I'll explain why. Um, this radiator is coming out. This was just a placeholder. I do actually have a new 240 we're gonna stick in there. So all I have to do is the initial uh, flushing of this because it's brand new to get any leftover solder flux out. The 480 needs to be flushed. We'll show you guys how we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna kind of start playing around with some things here. In terms of fittings, this is the part that's always a little bit interesting because when I built Skunk Works the first time, if you were using Hardline, the only two sizes you had to choose from were 12 millimeter, which were typically used uh, uh, and really made popular by Bits Phoenix. Bits Phoenix, no, Bits Power. And then EK sort of jumped on 12 millimeter. Now you've got 12, 13, 14, 16. Why do we hate 15? I don't know. What did 15 do? Does 15 piss somebody off? But anyway, I digress. I'm gonna be using 13 millimeter. To me, it's my favorite size. It's got three, three millimeter wall thickness because it's a 10 millimeter ID, 13 millimeter OD, three millimeters. 13 minus 10, three. That's how that works. Some people really complicate that and that, or overcomplicate that, which is why I decided to just condescendingly point that out. These fittings right here are 13 millimeter Primo Chill fittings from Primo Chill. And these have some sentimental value as well because look at the packaging. Look at the difference in packaging. I'm not sure they even use the same revolver packaging. See this one? When I originally got these fittings, the brand was so young, they didn't even have, they just sourced like these white cardboard boxes and just threw the fittings in there and some card or some little foam cutouts. But these are the actual leftovers from Skunk Works, uh, I think like version two. So these have sentimental value, they're unused. They have not been put into a system, but they were purchased uh, in case needed for Skunk Works. You can see Skunk Works obviously went to chrome or nickel plated Primo Chills. So going back to black, remember I told you I wanna go back to the V1 where we did black and yellow. And uh, black and yellow, black and yellow, black and... Even I'm disappointed that that was a reference. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the agenda today, get this cleaned out, uh, figure out what graphics card I'm gonna use. I'm probably gonna go ahead and use this guy. This is the Further Wind 3 uh, 3090. But I didn't wanna go with a Founders Edition card, because if I water cool that, it'll be super short. And really, your graphics card, it's gotta be big and oversized. It's, it's just, it's, you show it off. And I'm gonna be probably vertical mounting it right here. So having a big old giant card like this isn't gonna leave me a whole lot of room for fittings against that block. So maybe I'll rethink that uh, or that pump. That's a problem now that I think about it. We got some planning to do here. If it goes there, the output of the block or the pump can go underneath the card, which will be fine. I'm not opposed to it being like this. However, with it being like this, can sometimes make it easier to bleed and it really fills out the system. Although I've been doing vertical mount on things a lot lately and I kind of feel like going back to the old school method. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I got a little distracted and I didn't order any of the parts that I needed. So we're not ready to get there yet. So let's take this, these rads back out and let's start tearing things down. Okay, let's move on to this guy right here. My pump of choice, almost everybody knows this, is the Lang D5. I like the D5 for multiple reasons. One, it's not loud. It's really not loud. Two, it moves an incredible amount of volume. It's not necessarily the highest flow rate, but we don't have a lot of stuff to have to flow through here. And a D5 is more than capable of moving fluid through two radiators and two blocks. This is a uh, analog or a non-digital so you turn it you have to turn that knob to increase the pump speed i personally like the non-pwm fans no not fans pumps because when you're bleeding a system and you fill it i don't have the motherboard and stuff on because we don't have all the air out of the system i'm going to be obviously checking for leaks and stuff so i don't want to deal with the 
monitor or the, the motherboard and the CPU and the GPU all being powered. And when you don't see, it doesn't see a PWM signal. I haven't been able to figure out the logic as to why. However, the pump will either default to full speed, which is great for moving air or moving pockets of air out of the system, or it defaults to its lowest speed, which does not move air pockets very well. Do you guys remember back when 20 series first launched and I did the two 2080 Ti's in there like you can see, and then when we put the system back together, we were having shutdowns because we didn't realize one of the well, technically both of the pumps weren't turning. They were turning on, but they weren't turning. And I showed you guys by sticking my mic up against it, you could hear the pump go click, 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 click. That's like basically where it's uh, turning itself off because it sees too much resistance. That's where we opened up the pump when we cleaned that little ceramic bearing because it got all kind of gunked up and it didn't want to move. That is something I think, I don't know how, but I think that's a, a some sort of a drawback of the VPP pump because I have seen so many people, including Paul's Hardware, complain about the quote unquote failure rates of these exact pumps. I just think that's what's happening. They're getting gunked up. People aren't actually opening them up and cleaning them when they do these complete system flushes, which is leading to that particular failure. I, I, I can't blame them for being mad. I just think there was, uh, there was a little bit of lack of understanding this particular pump's drawback because it's not a D5, it's basically a D5 clone. We know how clones go sometimes. They cause wars. Clone wars? But I don't want to potentially deal with that again. This pump has been sitting dry forever. So I'm going to be removing it and putting on a different pump. Unfortunately, it's a lot of screws to get to it. So just like a regular D5, like standard housing, like the ugly Swift Tech looking one, it's held on with a collar. This one just happens to be square, as you can see. And then there's an O-ring right here that seals it. So we'll take that off because we want to clean that. And then this just comes off. And as you can see, that's literally it. It's just this collar, that O-ring that holds this into there, which is how you get your seal. We're actually not too dirty in there. You can see there's only one spot on the outlet of the pump that we've got some sediment there. That's gonna be easy to clean. That's the nice thing about this being acetal. It doesn't leach anything. It's still really clean. Because when I put that system together, I mean, we did a full teardown. So this is looking pretty good. I do need to remove the reservoir tube. Check the O-ring in here. That O-ring is one that can tend to tear or shear if you over tighten the reservoir uh, tube. So I'm just taking a dental pick, getting up underneath it. See, we got a little bit of dirt in there. You see they're two different sizes too. You don't get these mixed up. The small one goes inside. The big one goes on the back side for the pump. We do need to clean the top though, see? We've got some nastiness happening there. If you look at the very top, we got some nastiness happening in there. But look at the, all the sediment in this O-ring. Check this out. See in there? See, this is the kind of stuff we're looking for. We're gonna clean all that out. All this stuff can make its way back into your loop and you don't want that. This actually doesn't look too bad. If you look down inside there though, you can see the O-ring is pretty dry. There's buildup in there. Down inside here, ooh, it's also magnetic, obviously. See? So down inside there is where it gets all built up and gummy. And that's when the pump seems like it's failing. It's just that turns into kind of like a tacky sort of substance, depending on the, especially if it's glycol based, because glycol can sort of get gum, gummy over time. Uh, that is where this starts to get hung up. This is the ceramic bearing I was tearing, te tearing you, telling you about. If it gets all nasty in there, then it doesn't spin very good. Like right now, in my opinion, that's too much resistance. This is also an example as to why you never run your pump dry. Fluid gets down in here and it creates a barrier between this bowl and this spinning impeller, which is why if you ever start it up dry and you hear it making that nasty squeaking sound, you're hearing this metal on metal contact because it'll turn sideways all weird and then it will make some nastiness. But I don't see any wear marks in there because I know how to use my systems and I don't run them dry but we're gonna change this pump. So this is just a one gallon jug that we cut off. We also put hot water in here mixed with just some regular detergent. I'm gonna throw the O-rings in. I'm gonna throw the top in after I take this fitting off. See, look at that, how nasty it is in that one. Same thing, uh, Nick, I think I need a little more fluid level here. I don't have enough for everything to go in there. Why do you keep calling it fluid? Mm -hmm. It's a fluid, right? It is, so it's air. 
There's a lot of fluid in that. That's actually technically no. full. <laughs> No. no, 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 no. This is the internet. We do not give them room to say technically. <laughs> the two things the internet needs to stop saying is technically and to be fair. To be fair, technically correct is the best kind of correct. <laughs> All right, now that we have a little bit of extra fluid level, I'm just gonna let that soak in there for a little bit. Um, the nice thing about acetal is it doesn't really expand when it gets wet, obviously. That'd be a bad thing in, in, <laughs> in rigs, but... Uh, I'm gonna let the hot water sort of soak into some of that sediment. Oh, I gotta put this guy in there too. So, this is the part that's kind of boring. We wait. So I'm gonna set this aside. I'm also gonna go ahead and put these fittings in there because that's what your, uh, your opaque style fluids or your pastels, that's what they look like on the inside. Radiator time. This has got the same nastiness in it. Uh, what I tend to like to do, if I have the parts, is I'll set up a temporary loop with just a pump and just uh, the rad. I, I don't care about there being any blocks or anything in there. That way it can just circulate. It can circulate. But I reverse the order. Here's how you can tell the, the order. The dirtiest side is the outlet. That's the fluid that was coming out of the rad. The cleanest side is where the fluid was going in because it's gonna flow through the rad and then it's gonna come out and this is where it meets resistance with the fitting and there's a little step down because the fitting is, has the fit inside there. So then it just gets all baked onto there. So what I would do is run the hottest water that I can. Now remember, even radiators that have no fans have passive cooling uh, a factor to them. So I would then dump the water out and repeat with hot water as fast as, as much as possible. The other thing I would do is legitimately just use sink water on the tap as high as possible. Your, your faucet is threaded, so you can actually get uh, G threadings, that, depending on what size faucet you have, that are thread on there to a G quarter, and then you can literally just put a barb and a tube and hook it on there, and then just let it run. Yes, I know sink water has lots of minerals. Yes, I know this is worse than the sink water. We want to get this out as much as possible, but I would take the original outlet and turn that into the inlet to get reverse flow. That way we get water going in the areas that typically it would just sort of bypass because of the turbulent parts of the corners to get it as clean as possible. If you don't want to do all that, you can use a cleaning solvent. Mayhem's does make these cleaning kits that allow you to be able to use chemicals to clean your stuff. It has skulls on it. You need to definitely pay attention to your local regulations on how to properly dispose of this stuff. Throwing it down the gutter or down the toilet is not a good idea, especially considering the fact that it is corrosive. I'll come back to this though. I'm not planning on using the corrosive stuff. I'm not planning on using the corrosive stuff today. We're gonna try the hot water method first to see how much of it I can actually get cleaned and out of the system. So when it comes to radiator cleaning, one of the things that I'll do is I'll use the hot spigot. You also wanna make sure that that fitting is at the highest side and that you tilt it a little bit so the other fitting is at the highest point so that we can make sure, it's, it's coming, it's coming. A little more. So you can make sure that it actually fills and doesn't come right back out of that one. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna cap it with these. So you can see how clean that's already gotten just on the threads with just the hot water. Because one of the things that really breaks down these pastel type fluids is heat. And that's one of the reasons why we think the yellow fluid kept failing in the past is because I had three graphics cards on there. And even though I had a 560, the coolant temp would still get really hot. And that's what they sort of found in a lot of their findings was that the high heat breaks it down. So let's go in here and do the Harlem Shake. Okay, so this has been soaking and the water's still warm. So now I'm gonna let this continue to soak, but let's go ahead and start taking pieces out of here. I haven't even scrubbed it yet. And I kind of want to show just how much of the stuff is gone, like not still in there. I feel like when people do their cleanings, the one key ingredient they leave out is what? Heat. Yeah, it'll break it down. <laughs> break it down. I'm not gonna break it down. I'll break it back. <laughs> <laughs> There's one other ingredient I'm gonna use because I have access to this, and that's gonna be compressed air to blow out as much as possible. But the stubborn spots, like you can see right there, I'm just gonna take some more of the soapy water, get the toothbrush in there as best I can. If I need to, I'll take the paper towel, kind of roll it up like you're getting ready to stick it up your nose like you have a nosebleed or something. Then just kind of, just work it. Just work the hole. It's all about the pace 
not about the intensity. Well, then right when you figure out it's working, you don't change anything, right? Yes. If it's, if it's working and getting results, don't experiment. Yeah. You've experimented. You found... Don't speed up. Don't slow down. No, you found what you wanted. Don't, don't stop, for sure. Don't yeah, stop. Yeah, don't. Now, one of the things that can happen with that sediment in there is it can actually stain. So what I'm looking to see here with this is if I can scrape it off. And if you can see that, like... I'm using a sharp pointy thing and I'm not making a whole lot of impact on it. So I'll probably put this piece back in and let it sort of soak some more while I move on to the other stuff like the O-rings and whatnot. So here's the top. So I'm most concerned about this one. This one had a lot of stuff. So you can see, yeah, you can see the heat and the soap is definitely starting to break it up. What I should have got is some bottle brush cleaners because this would have helped me get down inside here with the threads. Oh, look at that. Look, see all the stuff that's getting on there? Rinse and repeat, literally. All right, so now I'm gonna use compressed air to get a lot of the, get it dry and then kind of see where we are. I'm, I feel pretty confident with using the paper towels and the pick and rubbing, rubbing it around in there without bottle brush cleaners that it'll be okay. So I'm actually feeling pretty good about this. Uh, some folks might be like, you need to get every single bit out. The problem is you're never gonna get everything out, especially if you consider how many years old this one is. The dirt that's really stuck was insulated by more stuff on top of it. So now we've got rid of the top layer, you can let it soak again. And we just keep working our way around the parts. So here we go, here's how they turned out. You can see they look a whole lot better, not perfect, um, there's, so if you look down the threads, you can see what looks like hairs. Those are just where the threads have been shaved over time from fittings being removed, added, removed, added, removed, added. And that's one of the uh, characteristics of acetal because it's so soft. But if you can see in here now, this is way better. The top is less important in terms of cleanliness, in my opinion, as the pump base. So as you can see here, we've got a whole lot of improvement versus where we were. Now here's the thing, I know some people are gonna get really anal retentive and be like, it needs to be perfectly clean. That's fine. Uh, this is not gonna be a problem based on my experience I've had in the past. So I'm going, to, I'm going to limit the amount of time I spend on something I believe to be superficial versus uh, something that's absolutely necessary. The O-rings, as you can see, nice and clean. No sediment on there, nice and soft, kind of rehydrated because they were soaking in that water. Let's talk about, however, before we get to the radiator, these fittings. And one of the reasons why I rarely, unless the system is fairly new, reuse fittings. Every single manufacturer uses a slightly different grade of brass. Most of these are brass underneath, not copper. There's no point in having copper. Plus I think copper would be too soft for fittings. But these are brass, nickel plated brass or painted, powder coated, whatever. Look at the inside of these. These are about six and a half years old. Same thing with these right here. These are um, six and a half years old. So that's why I'm like, dude, for a six and a half year old piece of material that has been seen, I don't know how many different fluids, I don't know how many different revisions. This was sitting there empty, exposed to the air, which is probably the worst thing you could do to it. That's why I've had that one still sitting there full because at least in a liquid form, it's not gonna dry up and get all crusty. I do need to take care of the rest of that system eventually, but Look at the fittings here, because depending on the kind of fluid you use, it will start to eat the nickel plating. That is just what happens with nickel plating. Anyone that's ever drained their system after a certain amount of time will usually notice a discoloration in their nickel. If you run it for a long period of time, and then this was emptied and exposed to air, I believe that, ex that accelerated the corrosion possibly, that will not come off nor come clean. It's extremely rough. They're trash. I'm not gonna be reusing these. In fact, just to make sure we don't, those go in the trash. So. It sucks, they're not supposed to be a consumable part, but it's just what you deal with. Everybody's plating thickness is different, plating process is different, manufacturer they're plating with is different. So that's why we just go new fittings because clearly we want it to look like that. What we're gonna do now is we are gonna go ahead and just drain it, like pour it out into here. What I'm looking for here is maybe any sort of a green tinge, which we have as you can see. That tells me that we obviously, and look at, look at all the stuff falling out in the bottom. We're gonna repeat this process more than once until I can get this coming out about as clear as possible. Then what we'll do is when the system is finally all together and it's getting its you know leak testing and stuff, that's when we'll put in some chemicals to try and get it as clean as possible. Yeah, so that's, like ants. Yeah, that's three. It does look like ants. Huh? So that's three flushes right there. So that's after four flushings right there. Uh, this, most of the sediment's gone, still slightly blue and then uh, still a little bit of pieces of that black stuff. 
So after five flushings, we just got a whole bunch of black stuff to come out. So I might just go ahead and hook this inline filter up. Not a whole lot more I can do today. I know today's video is a little more disappointing and boring, uh, but this is the important stuff. And one of the things I was really adamant about when I, I explained in part one is that I really want this build to have original parts from Skunk Works. That way it's not just, you know, all new parts and a different name. It's about making sure that I have some sort of spirit or soul in there. Kind of like the 68 Camaro that I'm restoring. A lot of aftermarket body work on there because, you know, rust and stuff. But I want to make sure that we keep as much of the original car as we can. That way it at least maintains, uh, like you go get a Dynacorn body. Is it really a 68 Camaro? No, because it was built in 2020, <laughs> you know? Doesn't count in my opinion. So after blowing compressed air and stuff through it, short of actually letting the loop circulate with the filter in there, that's about as clean as I'm gonna get this. Um, brand new reservoir tube, because like I showed you this other one, although it looks really good, does have, I don't know if it even picks up on camera, it does have some scratches all the way around it from the upper ring. So I'm just gonna change it with the new one. I said I was gonna do that in part one. Now it's time to put this all back together so that we can start reassembling stuff. This is also a perfect opportunity to be like, I fixed it! Uh, I'm obviously using my iFixit toolkit for this. They've got some uh, awesome deals going on right now. Uh, every single month this year, actually, they have a different promo that's going. And we uh, obviously are huge fans of iFixit and they're fans of ours. So do me a favor, go down in the description below. You guys can find uh, some links to their current promotions, uh, sign up page and all that sort of stuff. The nice thing about iFixit, they're huge, 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 Proponents, obviously, for right to repair, which just got a huge legal win this month in the United States. And iFixit has definitely been one of the people uh, that has been heavily involved in that campaign, giving everyone right to repair their stuff. That whole warranty void, if open, yada, 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 crap, can go each. And iFixit is uh, also a great resource for finding repair guides. So they have got tens of thousands of guides on their website that can show you how to tear down your various electronics, which tools are theirs to use, specialty tools also necessary, like pentalobes and stuff that are uh, something Apple came up with to try and keep people from opening their device, which is bullshit. Uh, they came up with tools to tell Apple to go eat crap so that you can open up the device and fix it. But laptops, monitors, consoles, phones, tablets, they've got repair guides on, I think something like 60,000 different devices that you guys can go in there and repair your own stuff. So links are down below. No explosions and stuff in this one, just a serious conversation about how important it is to repair your stuff. It's easier than you think half the time. Literally, as I'm putting stuff back together right now from something I'm recycling, rather than being like, time to get a new one. So, link down below, go and give them some love. Yeah. I'm just gonna let that hover on there because it's not like, you know, going all crazy. Yeah. And once I, the tube is up here, that will hold it tight. I always like to mount my <laughs> I always like to mount my reservoir and tube combo or pump combo to the radiator. A lot of people just think that's sort of like cheating, but that's what that's for. A little Mac racket and stuff. All right, let me clean this mess up real quick. We'll get that rad back in there and then we can get over with the <clears throat> most boring part of any one of these build blogs. Build blogs? Build logs, which is just the cleaning, the boring aspect of reusing parts. Yeah, this is, like I said, guys, this is, this is the not so glamorous part of all of this, but this is actually the part that I enjoy. This is, these are the videos I used to make all the time and I stopped doing because people, just, I felt like just didn't care about any of the build log type stuff and everyone now is telling me like, screw that, we love the logs. So we're doing the logs. Okay. All this is coming off, right? All we care about is the board. The thickness is usually no thicker for the block than where the power plugs are. That's about how thick it is. So as you can see, it goes back far enough to where the cooler is blocking this plug right there, which is the outlet, but the, the card itself isn't. And then that leaves me plenty of room still to have a 90 degree fitting here with a drain plug. So guys, that's where we're stopping for today. I hope you learned something about cleaning. I've had a lot of requests, people ask me about flushing radiators, how I do it. Uh, this was a non-chemical flush, I wanna point that out. This was just hot water, which you'd be surprised what that does to the sediment in a lot of these uh, types of materials. Not to mention almost everything is based on water. Even if it's glycol, it still has a water mix and water, especially hot water, does have a good effect on breaking up stuff that's stuck in there and getting it out. So now that I know 
New pump, reservoir is perfectly clean, new tube, the top's all clean. Uh, I'm not concerned about it at all. This radiator's clean. This one's not staying in. This is a brand new block. I feel confident that this loop will now be ready for me to move forward with it. I also have to order my custom cables from Cable Mod because that's the, uh, the ca custom cable sleeves we're gonna be using. And I think we will go ahead and go with a yellow fluid. It sucks if it turns colors on me. I've got a lot of practice at flushing it out. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this build series, make sure you guys subscribe, share it with somebody that's maybe talking about doing their own build series. This can give them some ideas. And uh, thanks for hanging out today. And we'll see you guys in the next one.